Let's turn to 152. 152. God, God has meant so much to me. I want to praise His holy name. His grace and truth have set me free. This blessed truth I would proclaim. It is my hope, my strength and guide. His spirit does my soul inspire. For me, he bled and groaned and Christ is the Savior I desire. This Savior is our living bread, our wisdom and our righteousness. We eat His flesh, we drink His blood. He Thank you. 
450.
Good morning. Certainly is good to see each one of you here with us this morning. We're uh, thankful for the opportunity uh, to come into uh, this place, <clears throat> sing hymns and praises to the Lord. Uh, we're thankful um, for the spirit that the Lord has given us to, to sing, sing about him, sing about us, and to sing about what he's done for us, uh, that certainly is um, uplifting. So we're thankful for our song service. Uh, we're thankful to the Lord for our song leaders. We just pray the Lord's continued blessing over them. Um, as we come to meet here this morning, we have many, of course, that we would like to try and pray for. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for. Um, 
We're thankful, like I said, that we're able to be here. We're thankful uh, for each one of you. We're thankful for the health that the Lord has blessed us with, all our natural and spiritual blessings. Um, it seems, uh, you know, that the, um, the sadness and the, the prayers of uplifting sometimes take forefront of the, um, the good things or the blessings that we should be thankful for all the time. You know, the psalmist wrote that uh, it would be just impossible to record the blessings that we've experienced in our lifetime from God. <clears throat> so that being said, we uh, continue to be in prayer for Brother Gene, Sister Wanda, uh, Sister Ruth, and Sister Virginia, Sister Ruth's brother Robert. We just pray the Lord's continued blessing upon them. Uh, we want to remember Brother Ned. He uh, continues to be in his nursing home. Brother Gene uh, told me this morning that he has COVID. I wasn't aware of that. So. Uh, we just pray for Brother Ned's uh, well-being. Pray the Lord's blessings. I want to remember Sister Jessica and her upcoming uh, surgery on the 12th of about her right shoulder. We just all would be well with that, as well as her grandfather, Brother Jerry, and Brother Billy Carlock. Just pray the Lord's blessing on them. Um, a few from No Creek. Sister Gay Dunn is back in the hospital. Uh, she has an infection on... So we pray that the Lord's blessing there. Uh, Sister Bennett and Sister Merlin continue to pray for them. We're thankful that it's as well with them as it is. <clears throat> Brother Jonathan, um, I think it was, well, maybe a month ago that he had asked for a home in the church. He's in a wheelchair and poor, not the best of health, but uh, he is determined to be baptized. Um, so we've arranged, uh, Lord willing, be in prayer that uh, church would meet there on uh, next Saturday, I suppose, at the YMCA in Moxville. They have a lift that can lower him down into the water, and there he can be baptized. <clears throat> There's only one mode of baptism for any believer that wants to be baptized. And I believe if someone wants to be baptized in whatever condition that the Lord would make a way. So we're thankful uh, for that. Be in prayer for that, if you would. Um, Elder Jimmy Booth, we prayed for him many times, has passed away. His service is uh, today. Uh, Elder Miller, I think, would, is officiating that. So we'd be in prayer for both of them. I know that they were pretty close. <clears throat> uh, my mother had going through some health difficulties. We asked the Lord's blessing uh, with that. Uh, Brother Michael, which... Uh, has visited with us from time to time here. He is uh, going through some difficulties. We just ask the Lord's blessing upon him. Uh, we mentioned uh, Wednesday evening, I believe it was, uh, the Lowrance family. Their 17 year, seven year old daughter was, uh, as a result of an accident, passed a traffic accident, passed away. And come to find out, her 16 year old cousin was driving that car and. There was a 13-year-old sister also injured in that car. So there's a lot of tragedy with that family. So we'd ask the Lord's uh, blessing upon them. <clears throat> uh, we're thankful for the country in which we live. We pray the Lord's continued blessing upon us. Uh, we ask the Lord's blessing upon our military and law enforcement, first responders, and uh, those people that uh, uh, serve to try to protect us. We just pray the Lord's blessing. We ask the Lord that he would bless us here uh, this afternoon. Uh, we would feel the moving and the presence of his spirit uh, come down and uh, move us this, after, this morning. Is there anyone else we'd like to call out? Okay, no one else being mentioned. We'd like to stand and sing a hymn and ask Brother Kevin if he would uh, open service with prayer. Brother Gene? Number 92. Number 92. I need thee every hour, most
Now, Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before thee this hour, giving thee thanks for the opportunity and the privilege that we've had to be in thy house in the worship service, that we can sing songs under thy great name and lift our voices in praise and adoration. And as we just sang, Lord, we need thee every hour. We know, Lord, many times through the day that we need thee every hour, but we don't call on thee every hour. Lord, forgive us for that. Lord, our flesh is weak. Thou has given us a spirit, Lord, that communes with thee. And we pray, Lord, that we would be able to put the inner man first, that we might push this flesh aside, that we could praise and worship thee in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We ask, Lord, that thou would be with us as we've come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, that thou would bless our efforts, that thou would help us, Lord, to look upon those things that thou hast promised unto us and thou hast told us through thy word and in thy scripture, Lord. We know that thou hast wrought the plan of salvation. We know, Lord, that thou art the author and the finisher of our faith. We look unto thee for all of our needs. We pray, Lord, that thou would be with those that were called out today, Lord, those that are sick, those that are afflicted. We ask, Lord, that thou would be one of them and thou would give them what they need and help them, Lord, in their time of need. We know, Lord, that thou art able. We know, Lord, that thy will would be done. And Lord, that we would be reconciled unto that. Help us, Lord, to do all we can to help our brothers and sisters Lift them up in prayer. Help them in any way that we can. We ask, Lord, that thou would give us strength that we might do that. We pray, Lord, for this body of believers in this place to meet here, that have not met here for many centuries. And, Lord, we ask that thou would help us to fill our place, that we might be edified, that we might follow after thee and all the things that thou hast directed us to do. We pray, Lord, that thou would give us the strength through thy power that we could follow after those things. That we would be found worshiping in a way that would be pleasing in thy sight. We ask, Lord, that thou would bless Brother Eddie as he's, he's to come before us, Lord, that thou would lift him up, that thou would give him strength, that thou would empower him through thy, thy holy presence, Lord, and us all, that we might hear those things that would be beneficial unto us. That would give him what we need, get him to tell us what we need to hear through thy word. We ask, Lord, that thou would be with uh, those that are may be bereaved, and we ask, Lord, that thou would heal and heal their broken hearts. We ask, Lord, that thou would go with, uh, be with us in this land that we live, Lord, the country that we inhabit. We know, Lord, that there is much strife and turmoil on every hand, but we know, Lord, that thou art still ruling and reigning, and that thou Thou hast the king heart, king's heart in thy hand. We pray, Lord, that they would, that our leaders and governors that would rule over us would look unto thee for guidance. We pray, Lord, for that. And we ask that, that thou would help us, Lord, that we would be able to worship thee in spirit and in truth, and that we would have the freedom to exercise these things in this land. We pray, Lord, that it would be for generations to come. We know, Lord, thou will have a witness somewhere on this earth when thou dost return. And we pray, Lord, it would be in this area even in this spot. We ask, Lord, that thou would go with us through the furtherance of this service. We pray, Lord, for thy leadership and thy guidance. And we need thee every hour. So in the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. thankful for that prayer and we, we certainly hope that you would continue to pray as we meet here this morning to worship. Uh, no true words spoken and we need thee every hour. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, if we hope this is of the Lord's will, we'd like to go to Daniel chapter 3. Many things are happening in this chapter, and I believe it's uh, really a complete chapter. It has to deal with um, the Lord's people, uh, the Lord, how we worship, who we should worship, and the goodness and the kindness of God toward his people every day.
Um, we know that uh, Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel, has to do, as we see in uh, chapter 1, that um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, in the book of Jeremiah is described as a servant of God. Uh, the Lord uh, removed his protective power from the children of Israel. And as it was given in prophecy that they would be taken into bondage by this uh, Babylonian king. And as we see in da Daniel chapter, verse 1, chapter 2, And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, and with parts of vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the children of Israel were taken into captivity. They were prisoners, and uh, many uh, were removed from their homeland and taken into Babylon, uh, where they lived. Well, many of them lived their entire life there, but at the, we know that at the end of 70 years, the captivity was released, uh, that the Lord had prophesied that there would be a man called Cyrus, uh, the king, uh, uh, and uh, that he would... Um, under the direction of God, uh, the people of Israel would be delivered once again from that bondage uh, in which they were in. While in that bondage, we have some historical accounts that happened uh, to some of God's people while they were in that bondage. And this afternoon, we'd like to speak about um, three of them. And, um, and they're given, I think the Lord wants us to know who they are. I think if I've counted in chapter three, I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are mentioned 13 times. <laughs> and you know, they're always mentioned together. I think that's significant. And you know, it makes me think that it certainly is good to have uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's good, it's good to have uh, companions in this world as we go through it uh, with all the adversities and trials and tribulations that we may come across, uh, that we would have someone uh, that we can lean on and i know that uh we can lean on god and god directs us for that but in the flesh it's good to have brothers and sisters in christ uh, that will uphold you and uh, the hymn that we sang that we can bear one another's burdens and that some of the things that we go through and uh, the trials and afflictions you know in the book of corinthians it lets us know that we may comfort someone else because we have gone through this identical thing that they are going through. And you know, I'm thankful that the Lord has said that there's no trial or affliction that would be too great for us while we go through this world. <clears throat> so it's a blessing if you are able to stand with someone else of like faith as we go through this world, encouraging and holding one another up from time to time. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. <clears throat> now we know that Nebuchadnezzar over the king of Babylon was the ruler of many nations surrounding them. It, it was a big empire that he had control over. So Nebuchadnezzar wants people to worship him. So he devises a worship service for him. 
And the goal of his worship service is that he would attract as many people as he possibly could from everywhere to come and worship him, bow down to him. Now, he made a statue of gold. You know, what's it saying? Three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. That doesn't sound too tall, but when you think of it as 88 feet tall, there's probably no building in, Lo in Locust or Mox or Midland or any other place like that that's 88 feet tall, nine feet some wide. I mean, this was a huge statue. Kind of reaching all the way up in the air to the, in the sky. Now, to attract all these that would come and worship, well, let's just read. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces, or provinces to come to the dedication of the image of which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up within the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image of, that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I think Daniel's trying to get us to the point that Nebuchadnezzar had set up an image that he was instructing people to bow down and worship. And it wasn't just all of the Babylonians and all of the non-Israelites, but the children of Israel, which had been taken into captivity, were instructed to come and to bow down at the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. <clears throat> now they were under strict orders, the children of Israel. Well, well, I would say strict orders. Wouldn't you call the Ten Commandments a strict order? Do you remember what the, ten, uh, the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments are? Uh, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 says this. Well, let's just read 20, uh, Exodus chapter 20, starting at the verse, first verse. And God spake all these words, saying, He's speaking to Moses to deliver these Ten Commandments down to the children of God. Now, these Ten Commandments are for the children of God. And, the Lord spe and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And notice this, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord thy God, and I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation unto them that hate me. So that's the commandment. And you know, we're under those commandments today. We should not serve any other God. And that's with a G-O-D or idol that would take our attention, our desire, our service from the service in the kingdom of God. We should not bow down to any other God. We should not make any image. You know, in the book of Judges, I want to, you know, there was a purpose that the Lord gave these Ten Commandments. Uh, the Lord, you know, Let's see, I'm going to go to Judges chapter 8, but well, let's just get right there. Judges chapter 8, I believe it is. You know, after Gideon's triumph, we tried to speak about this Wednesday a little bit. Gideon's triumph. 
you know, the children of God were, uh, oh, they had to be exuberant because they, they, they were able to behold the victory that God had given them. And you know, it says, and you remember they started out with 32,000 men. 32,000 soldiers. God said, that was too many. That was too many because if we win this battle with 32,000 soldiers, then you're going to think it's the men and their strength that won this battle. So he whittles it down to 300. Now, you know, in the book of Judges, uh, there was no king that ruled over Israel. Well, there was a king that ruled over Israel, and that king is God. But as we heard in the prayer that uh, Lord strengthen us because our flesh is weak. Our flesh is weak to serve God, to, to appreciate and dedicate ourselves to try the best as we can to obey the Ten Commandments. So after the victory, what did the children, what did the men of Israel want? It says in 8.22, then uh, chapter 8 of uh, Judges, verse 22, it says, The men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And you know, in verse 27, well, it says this as it goes down. And it says that, And Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Orpha, and all Israel went thither, a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. made an ephod, put it on display in the city. And the flesh. I mean, would you think, would you think there's any good thing that could come when you break a commandment of God? You make an idol? It was a snare unto Gideon. And it led the children of Israel away to worship after that, instead of the God. Let's see, let me read that again. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself nor serve them for I, the Lord, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and so on. So I want to say this. From time to time, we come by a portraits or pictures of Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen one of those? And I used to just think, well, that's not appropriate because, you know, how do they know what Jesus looked like? There's really, there's no description of what he looked like, but you know, there is a description of what he looked like. There is a very good description of what Jesus looked like when he was at the cross at Calvary. And every time I see a, something that's supposed to be a resemblance or an image of Christ on the cross, it never looks like the description that's given in the scripture. So not only is it inappropriate because they just don't understand what Jesus might have looked like, but it's totally opposite against the scripture. How did he look at the cross at Calvary? If you have your Bibles, this is, a, this is something that's made in resemblance of things in heaven and things in earth. In Isaiah chapter 52, we see a good description of the 
image of Christ at the cross at Calvary. Isaiah chapter 52, in verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee. Now notice this. His visage was so marred more than any man. The impression that Isaiah is trying to give to us is that this man, Jesus Christ, in the flesh, was so disfigured by the cruel beatings that were administered unto him when he was taken by Pilate, bound and beaten, that he was nearly unrecognizable as a man. And his form more than the sons of men. That being said, we go back to Daniel chapter 3. So this is Nebuchadnezzar devising this worship service for him. How would he attract all these people? Very, very pleasing to the flesh. In verse 4 in chapter 3, it says this, Then a herald cried aloud to you, It is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and you worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, hath set up. So Nebuchadnezzar, sets up all, and it, you know, I think it's three to four times that we see this uh, phrase in here, and all kinds of music. Nebuchadnezzar brings together all of these instruments, all of these musicians, playing music to attract all these people to come to his worship service. And I would think that he attracted a bunch. And whoso fall it well, so that's one that's one what's the word I'm looking for? Enticement, I suppose, that he had to come to the worship service. And the next enticement that he had was fear. He scared them. I'm bringing all this music for you for your enjoyment. And now, if you don't bow down. You will die. You're going to die. That was Nebuchadnezzar's gospel message. That if you don't bow down, if you don't bow down right here at the time of this worship, then you will die. You will not live. Does that sound familiar to anyone? The worship service that are devised by man in, I think it's Matthew chapter 15, it says that they do worship in vain, coming up with the commandments and the doctrines of man. Therefore, at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, sapphic, and psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people in the nations and the languages and fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. You know what? It says that, but it's just a general statement because not everyone bowed down and worshiped that false god or worshiped that false gospel. Aren't you thankful there were some that really stood up for the truth? And they said, we're not going to bow down and worship this false God, but we're going to stand up and we're going to worship the true and living God. We will not bow down. And you say, well, what did they have to lose? They were just prisoners in a faraway land. They were prisoners, but you know what? They were pretty well off as the things of the world go. 
They were princes. They were over, you know, they didn't live in like barracks and, you know, things like that. They had pretty good jobs, so to speak. They were, they had the kings, they had Nebuchadnezzar's favor. They were elevated. They were actually rulers over a lot of people. He set them up to do that for him in his kingdom. Nevertheless, they still wouldn't bow down. Can anybody think of some excuse? Now, remember, it's Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Children of Israel. God's people. And I would assume that there are some that would go out there and just fall down at Nebuchadnezzar's feet and worship him with the mindset... that they're really not worshiping him. They're just doing this to kind of go through the motions to ease the death threat. And it says in verse 11, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And you know, this happened thousands of years ago but it's as true today as it was then. Not only do you see a disagreement, it didn't, it didn't say that Nebuchadnezzar was a little put off by this, it says this. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, in the Psalm, Psalm chapter two, it says, why do the heathen rage? You stand up for the truth, the truth about the living and what God has done, what Jesus is and who Jesus is. There's just not a disagreement. It's not like, hey, can we just get along? But it's a rage and a fury against those that would actually stand for the truth of God. You know, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said that uh, evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. It was pretty worse back then, but it says they're going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Nebuchadnezzar spake unto them and said, is it true? You're not gonna serve do you not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready that at that time when you hear the sound and all that, all types of kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast into that same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar asked him this question, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now, Nebuchadnezzar had had dealings with Daniel previous to this. And I think Nebuchadnezzar had a sense of God, that God is a mighty God, that, that this God that you serve, he's, he's strong, he's mighty, because he can reveal secrets or dreams that I've had that none of my other magicians or counselors could do. In that sense, this God that you serve is mighty. But see, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they knew God in a way I believe that Nebuchadnezzar didn't know God. And at the end, Nebuchadnezzar senses that he knows God, but I'm still out as to how if he knew them as true as Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. God in his creation 
gives everyone this sense that when you look at things that in nature that you would say something made that it was made that's a logical reasonable thing to think if you look at your watch or the next time you look at your watch would anybody think it's unreasonable that somebody made that that's a logical reasonable thing uh think make uh, these books Uh, the pews that you're sitting on, the cars that you get in and drive, the tires that are on the top, uh, everybody, everything was made. Native, of an Indian, Native American Indians, they had a sun god. They knew that there was, there, was a, there was a greater being, there was something that made these things in nature. Psalmist wrote, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, atheist, 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 they say in their head, there is no God. If they're atheist. See, the thing about if you can put away God, then you can put away all that God stands for. If there's not a God, then there's no, there's no right or there's no wrong. Because where did right all that come from? That come from God. Our morals, our values, all of that is relative. If there is no God, then what we think is as good as all of that or probably better because these are different times and different things, all of that included. But the word of God is sure as silver tried in the furnace of earth. And it's pure and it's just. And it's just as true today as it has ever been and ever will be. But he says, who is that God that should deliver you out of my hands? Who is that God? Well, who is that God? We know that that God is the God that created all these things. And we know that when we think of God, we think of omniscience that he is all knowing, we think of omnipotence, that he is all powerful. We think that if someone is sick, God is able to heal them up. He's able to deliver them. He can remove any sickness. We see time and time again when Christ walked this earth that he was a, a tremendous healer. But to understand and have to have the knowledge, I think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego has, they have to have something different than just some head knowledge of God. In Jeremiah chapter 24, it says this. And I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return to me with their whole heart. So in order for us to know this God that Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego had, we have to have the heart that God would give us to understand what God has done for us. You know, I think with a lot of the head knowledge about God, we see, we can see that there is something that, that is superbly strong and creative. But without the heart knowledge, I think we lose. Well, we don't lose. Well, we could lose it. In order for us to have an understanding about God's love towards his people, 
there has to be this heart that he's given. He's given us so that we can understand what God has done for his people outside of healing a sick or outside of making someone that's blind see. So how much love does God have in the first epistle of John? He's, God is love. But in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 3, it says, of whom the whole family, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. We heard that in prayer. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And I think what the Apostle Paul is saying there, that the love that, the love that God has, God being love and the love that God has for his people has no bounds. There's no searching it. It can't be found out. And to have an understanding of it, it passes all the knowledge which we can have in our heart, in our mind. But it gives us a glimpse of the love of God in this new heart in which he instills by this new birth, this spiritual birth, which he gives to us in regeneration. That he's given us this heart that we're able to understand or have an appreciation for the love of God. That would motivate us or encourage us that we would not bow down to any idol or golden image just at the threat of this natural life or the discomfort of this flesh. See, I think the true gospel message is that we serve God because he has loved us. We don't serve God so that he will love us. We serve God because he has loved us. <laughs> you see the difference? I mean, that's a big difference. That's a vast difference. You know, in the book of, uh, talk about God's love. The love of God is greater than. Uh, the book of Ephesians, when we sang um, the love of God, it talks about if the oceans were filled with God's ink, it would just, there would not be enough ocean to hold all the love of God. Now remember that God, we serve God because he's loved us. In Romans chapter 5, we read this. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for those not loving God, not doing godly things. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure. So this is Nebuchadnezzar. Who is or what is this God that you serve? We serve a God that commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You see, well, in the first epistle of John again, if we love God, it is only because of what? He first loved us and he's given this heart to us that we can have an understanding. If it wasn't for the love of God, we wouldn't, couldn't love him. As a matter of fact, even though this head knowledge that we have could, could point to some supreme being that made these things, do you know what our carnal mind is against God? 
It's not in favor with God. It's not, uh, well, God, I can understand these things, so I'm going to be obedient to you. Our carnal mind is enmity at war, total disagreement, rebellion against God. And yet, God loves us. And yet, God loves us. Who's the person that you love the most? The person that you love the most. What's the greatest act of love that you've done to express the love towards that person? You see, <laughs> even with this heart knowledge, it is hard to comprehend the breadth and the depth and the height of God's love. You know, in John chapter 3, verse 6, John chapter 3, 16, it's just, it says, for God so loved the world. And then in John chapter, the first epistle of John, 1 John chapter 3, it says this, behold, what manner of love? Let's look at that. First John. Who is that God? Who is that God that shall deliver you? In 1 John chapter 3, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. What manner of love God has given us. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Who is this God? Nebuchadnezzar, he might have known of some powerful being, but he didn't have an understanding of a God that had all power and all that could be so compassionate and have so much love towards his people that he would forgive their sins. But you know, even when we say that, that God has forgiven our sins, until we see how God has forgiven our sins, we're missing some of the breadth and the depth and the length of God's love. Because where did forgiveness come from? If God loved us and forgave us of our sins, where did that love lead God to? To what action? Well, Jesus says there is no greater love than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. And here in 1 John chapter 4, it says this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the covering in which we have forgiveness of our sins. He that knew no sins because of his love towards us was made sin that we would be made the righteousness of God. Who is this God? It's a God of love. It's a God of covenant. It's a God of truth. It's a righteous God. It's a just God. It's a forgiving God. In Jeremiah chapter 31, it says, Yea, I have loved thee with what kind of love? An everlasting love? Can you appreciate the, the love that God has towards you? It's an everlasting love. That takes the heart that God give you to have an understanding of that. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto them, said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer in the in this matter. We can give you our answer right now. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. We know the God, our God is able. Our God is able. And I want you to notice verse 18. They knew that God was able, but they didn't know that he would. You see, that's what faith is. They knew that God was able. And if he chooses to deliver me from this fiery furnace, he will. When Jesus went to the tombs, he called Lazarus out. He chose to deliver him at that point in time. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if my God that has loved me with an everlasting love that sent his son to die for me at the cross at Calvary that I would have eternal glory with him in paradise. If he chooses not to deliver me from this fiery furnace right now, O king, I will not bow down to you. I will not bow down. But if, it, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Because I believe that they knew of a better deliverance than the deliverance of this fiery furnace. You know, when Stephen was being stoned to death, Stephen being a deacon was expressing to the children of Israel their sins that they had committed and it says in verse 54 when they heard these things they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth you think god was able to deliver him from those stonings that he received was god not able he was able <laughs> did god deliver him I think in that sore affliction and in that fiery furnace, he saw God as he had never seen him before. He had a greater appreciation of his Savior, Jesus Christ, than he ever had before in that tribulation, in that affliction, in that fiery furnace. Being cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with the teeth, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. <laughs> and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Stephen saw that. And as he was being Stoned to death. 
It says in the 60 verse, 60th verse, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's the God that Nebuchadnezzar was asking them about. There was no fear of death, I believe, in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they knew of the death that they had been delivered from. If you take away the fear of death from man, how can you scare them? <laughs> Think about that. The Hebrews, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, they went in bound. But they were walking free in that fiery furnace. <clears throat> So let us look to our God that is able and that he has loved us with a love that we cannot be separated from. We cannot be separated from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even death, not even death. So these Nebuchadnezzars of the world that frightened people that said, hey, if you don't do this and if you die, you're going to be separated from God. That's not the truth. Because the Apostle Paul said, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Do you see how sure that is? Let us be strengthened uh, by the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, strengthened by the life of Christ who gave his life for us. But let us strengthen the fellowship that we have one with another. I think it was a difference. Daniel was by himself, he still stood up for the truth. But it went two or better than one. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes says. If one falls down, the other can pick him up. Three, four cord is, is stronger. Let us just rejoice in what God has done for his people. Let us rejoice in the love of God, that God loved us. And if you know that, if you rejoice in that, that's evidence that God has put that heart in you that you can know of his love. We publish the doors of the church open for the reception of members. If there's any that would like to have a home here, you have the opportunity to let it be known as we stand and sing. Brother Gene, what number?